My background is as interesting as any Hollywood production, television program, or Broadway production. I have often considered that Mr. Rod Serling could have never dreamt up an episode as bizarre as the life I've led this, thus far. Just take an example of the past five weeks. Five weeks ago, Brooks Agnew inspired me to move forward by praising my work and claiming that I made him famous. He's a seven-time bestseller on Amazon, but for some reason, the man praises me more than is due because he doesn't know me. Well, five weeks ago, I had a dream, and I shared it with Lucky, and we interpreted it. Now, this dream had nothing to do with anything about my current situation, having this radio show. Joe Joseph, bowing out, he offered me the show, and I accepted it. Now, five weeks ago, I decided I was going to do a YouTube video series as a foundation for a radio show because I wanted a radio show. And within that time, I was a guest on Kev Baker's show. I was a guest on Ken's show. Sean Carone had messaged me on Facebook to call in to him about 10 minutes before his show came on to fill in the second hour. Now, in my life of synchronicity and timing, that was not, didn't happen the way it was supposed to. I called his show with someone else. Her name is Margaret, and she told her story, and I continued to fill the second hour because I was on the phone, unaware that he had messaged me 10 minutes before the show. Uh, and then we go to Quest for Truth. After that show, Ken called Chris Geo and let him know how well I did and that I could do this job anytime he made the offer for me. That's just assuming that's what he said, but evidently that's what happened. I get the opportunity to co-host Joe Joseph's show, and I tell everybody at work I'm going to be a co-host on a radio show, and everybody is just so happy for me because they've seen where I come from, which is another long story, which I will get into later on this evening. So here I am. My first show, at one time, I was caught with four oxycodones in my car, which a friend I had taken to the pharmacy to purchase dropped them in my car. Now, that's the story I'm sticking to, Your Honor. I wound up doing four months in the stockade. And while I was in the stockade, I did some writing. I did some sketching. I did some doodling. I did some thinking. But the one thing that I was doing most of the time was I would have two or three gentlemen sit down at a table with me. And this is in 2003. I would sit down at a table with one, two or three gentlemen, and I would hold them spellbound for two, three, four, five hours. I would do this day after day after day. And one particular gentleman, he walked up to me and he said, you know what? At first, I thought you were crazy, but my God, you've got just about everybody in this jail cell sitting down and listening to you for hours. Would you mind if I sit down and listen to you? And I proceeded to tell him about my past, my life, and the book I was going to write. So I think David Icke may be the only person that could outdo me nonstop talking and hold everyone's interest. And I'm going to take a breath here for one second. That's enough of that. Well, my adventure and why I'm going to be on the Kev Baker show on the 29th of this month, a Thursday night, is to get a 41-year-old monkey off of my back. What happened in 1975 is I had an out-of-body experience. It was planned well, the meditation that led up to a, a spark between my eyes and off the bridge of my nose with the crack of a whip, I had been practicing how to attain this state. Well, I overdid it one day, and there was a great flash, not just this spark, 
not just the crack of the whip. There was no sound. There was no spark. An overwhelming flash of white light appeared. Next thing I knew, I am now outside of this sheet of the purest white light I have ever seen. And I am observing it from just above my head. Knowing that this was my spirit, I was wondering, where's my body? Because my consciousness is out here. My spirit is there. I began to think about my left knee. And believe me, it became a dark spot. It became a black hole. It became a void of light in a sheet of pure white light. Shortly after, shortly after, instantaneously of not thinking about my left knee, it became brilliant white light again. And here I am viewing my spirit from outside of it. I wondered, how do I get back, join consciousness, spirit, and body? And it was a simple process. I shook my left arm, which is pretty, pretty, <laughs> really strange sensation, to shaking your left arm from re remote control. Well, I sat up, dumbfounded, flabbergasted, but the entire time I spent in this state, I knew I had tapped into universal consciousness and I was privy to, to answers to questions that have never been asked. As I sat there, I kind of was a little disappointed because in this state, I did not look up and around me to see who was viewing me because the beacon of white light that I saw could not be ignored in many, many realms. So at this point, I got the answers to questions nobody ever asked. So I went for a walk in South Miami. I, I lived on the South Miami side of the street, but Coral Gables was across the street. So I went walking right down the middle of the street, and it came to me. I need a universal language. I need a language to store all the information that I had been privy to. I decided I was going to invent a universal language. Of course, well, what symbols are you going to use? You can't expect people to memorize symbols. So I decided I would use 10 numbers from 0 to 9 and 26 letters. I would assign each letter a number and a word value. And within minutes, as long as it would take me to explain it to you, I had it. I went inside, I wrote it down, and I began to wonder, what value does this have? Well, in Earth code, six is D, doing. Nine is Q, question. What is the first number you want an answer to? 69, and that is doing what, doing who, doing how. Okay, I continued on. It made sense to me. The number 86 is infinitely doing. Well, what is 86? You are infinitely running out of something. You are infinitely throwing away something. From this day forth, it, for about three weeks, I did the earth code in my head. I read numbers. I read signs. I was a tracker. I lost touch with the real world completely and absolutely. And to aid me in disconnecting from the real world, I had a friend who said, Bill, you need to read The Teachings of Don Juan by Carlos Castaneda. For those of you who don't know, Don Juan is not a lover. Don Juan was a Mexican Indian sorcerer. I read all five books, but the only thing that really stuck with me and made the most sense was, in order to be a warrior, you must maintain a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week separate reality from the reality you know. And I did. The thing is, I lost touch with the real world. Well, on March 31st, I walked into the Coconut Grove Playhouse my goal that day was to be seen by more people in Coconut Grove and to see more people than any person had ever done that day. I walked where I wanted to. I opened doors. I walked. I went 
everywhere and anywhere I wanted as if I were invisible. Nobody asked me any questions till I walked through a kitchen door and a gentleman, gentleman asked me, what are you looking for? And the simple answer that works every time is a job. Well, I continued to walk completely detached from reality, reading all the signs, reading, reading earth code ways. And I found myself opening a door and I was in the coconut grove playhouse. I proceeded to walk on stage, sit down at a piano and start playing that piano. As I'm sitting there playing at the piano, not actually playing the piano, I see a gentleman far stage right, open a door, look at me, close the door and disappear. I notice a gentleman up in the balcony, open a door, look at me, close the door. So as I'm tinkling on the piano, I see a gentleman approach the stage directly center, right down the center aisle. And out of the corner of my eye, I see his last two steps. Now he is standing at the stage, which is about waist high. I'm about to say, you look familiar, but he beat me to the punch. He said to me, who are you? Without thought or hesitation, I said, L. Ten, John, I tinkled a few more keys on the piano. I got up from the piano and I walked backstage. Now, L10 John in Earth Code is Life Amplified John. John Lennon Amplified Life, John the Baptist Amplified Life. And when you sit on a John and you fart, you amplify life. Okay, now I know I'm trespassing and I have got to get away from this gentleman who asked me, who are you? I went behind the curtains at my back, and I find myself backstage in the rigging, in the costumes, in the lockers, walking into a completely dark area. I come to a backstage door. I open that door, close that door, and tap my fingers on the, the outside of that door as if I'm still playing the piano. And I thought, cute trick. Well, it wasn't until years later I found out that when I opened that door and the sun was directly shining through that door, I blinded someone. I continued walking through the grove that day and I walked home about I don't know, a mile and a half in complete and absolute silence following the moon. The moon was over my apartment, so that's where I walked. When I arrived home, I, I had a great adventure. It was just another day in paradise. In the morning, I got up and I got on my motorcycle barefoot and I went back to the grove. Now, this was April 1st. I walked to Monty Trainer's Raw Bar Dock. I walk out to the end of the dock, sit down at the end of the dock, and light a cigarette. I smoked about half the cigarette, and I said, well, it's time to go. But before I, I got up to leave, I noticed there was a rainbow, there was an island, and there were fishies under my feet. Perfect day in paradise. I got up, and I started walking back. Halfway down the dock, a gentleman in a three-piece suit, put his hand on my shoulder, opened one of the lapels, and showed me an automatic pistol. At this point, he puts his hand on my shoulder and says, Who are you? I looked him dead in the eye as I stepped around his hand as I said, Superman. Because at that moment, I held the keys to the kingdom. I took about six steps and that gun went off. I don't know if he shot it in the air. I don't know if he shot it in the water. I don't know where that bullet went, but it didn't hit me. I continued to walk. By the time I got to the end of the dock, there were two City of Miami police officers who said, will you come with us? I said, sure. 
I followed him to the police car, no handcuffs, no frisking, no searching, no nothing. They opened the door. I got in it. And I thought these police officers were getting me away from this maniac with a gun who was connected because Monty Trainer is well known to be part of uh, that establishment. OK, I arrive at Dade County Jail. And, well, before I get there, the officer says to me, we want you to play a role. I, I said, you want me to be a good prisoner, a model prisoner? And they said, yes. Well, to fast forward, three days in jail with no charges, never being told that I was being arrested for trespassing. Well, it came time to appear before the judge in handcuffs. I'm sitting there. The judge comes out of the room and I jump up out of my seat and I do that little Sammy Davis Jr. impression of I am the judge. I am the judge. I am the judge. I knew that this would get me out of the situation I was in because I spent three long days, more than three days in a jail cell and never told why nothing. Well, they took me back to a little metal room. Uh, with a little metal table, with little metal chairs, and a gentleman in a suit sat down next to me. His first question was, do you hear voices? I said, of course I do. As I'm thinking, if I didn't hear your voice, how would I be able to answer your question? I sat there. Then he asked me, do you hear bells? And I said, of course I hear bells. Mm. Because all those clanging chains did sound like bells. The doors, the cuffs sounded like bells. But my answer was, yes, I can hear the frequency of bells. Well, this gentleman proceeds to fold his arms and drop his head as if he's going to sleep. I don't want to go on and on and on about it, but I spent two days in a uh, psych ward of a hospital, and then they finally took me to South Florida State Hospital. Now, this is where it gets freaky. An old biking buddy of mine walks on the floor and says, Wolfie, what are you doing here? I said, it's all a joke because this started on April 1st. I had friends in the music industry. I had friends, producers at uh, WPLG Channel 10. My adventure started when I walked into my bedroom and picked up my pillow as the Beatles were singing, You Never Give Me Your Pillow. From that moment on, the synchronicity in my life was of Rod Serling quality that he could have never dreamt of. I went from the jail cell in Dade County where I had seen mattresses in a shower. One night, I sat down in the middle of the floor. I It was a big room at about less than, I'd say, a quarter of the end of the big room was approximately eight to ten urinals, sinks, and commodes. I sat in the middle of the floor one night, and I flushed all the commodes, turned all on all the sinks, and just wanted to sit down and listen to the water. Well, the amazing thing is not one person, and there were at least 25 to 30 of us in that cell, not one person said, cut that out. Then I was taken to Dodge Memorial Hospital for a two-week stay. In Dodge Memorial Hospital, I was 21 years old, naive, and I didn't know what a psych ward was, so all I did was eat, sleep, and dream. I had three dreams till this day that were more more real than the entire life I've lived. And I never forgot those dreams. Well, after two weeks of them not seeing any uh, improvement of me, they shipped me off to South Florida State Hospital. Oh, I, I neglected to mention one thing. There was a piano on that ward and somebody had broken all the keys on that piano. I now find myself at South Florida State Hospital and my biking buddy, Mike, he says, I'll be back in a minute with your chart. He comes back with my chart and he says, Wolfie, they think you're crazy. I asked him, how long am I going to have to stay here? Well, when he told me seven weeks, I had a nervous breakdown. But 
all I could say to him is it's a joke. It's a joke. It's a joke. I thought my friends, uh, a, a music studio producer, friends that owned a uh, stereo shop. I thought these people were playing a joke on me. That's how far disconnected I was. Well, South Florida State Hospital, what do I see? I see a piano with all the keys broken, and I see mattresses in the shower. So I thought the joke continued. This was before my friend Mike walked on the floor. My mother, my brother, my couple of friends were with me every night, except for one Wednesday night when I sort of went into a panic. I was doing the Thorazine shuffle, of course. Shortly after accepting my situation of seven weeks in a state hospital, I seriously learned more about psychology, psychiatry than any of these doctors learned in their seven years of getting a degree. So I'll move on. The synchronicity. Okay. My mother is driving me home. We're going down University Drive and there is a wall uh, absolute wall of black. I have never till this day seen a wall of rain like this. My mother was afraid the car was going to turn over and she would not get to the overpass before this stuff hit us. We're sitting in the car in absolute and complete black because of the rain is so hard, except for the flashes of lightning. My mom said, God is mad at somebody. And I was thinking, and I would not say it because I was crazy. I would not say it. No, mom, God is celebrating for me being free. Well, my mom was right. Uh, that, that storm flipped over several uh, airplanes at uh, North Perry Airport, which is across the street. And I must, I must interject here. My friend Mike says to me, do you know where you are? I gave him the exact location, the street, the address, and what was across the street. And that's when he got my chart and he told me, you know, they think you're crazy. Well, synchronicity continued. My mom said all I had to do was go home and rest. And I'm thinking, hell no. My brother picked up my motorcycle, which sat out in front of Monty Trainer's restaurant for three days with a flat tire. He and some friends put my bike in his van and drove him to my mother's house. He also picked up my Marantz 4240 quad radial amplifier and my RTR column speakers. And all I wanted to do was hear music because music was the thing that sank everything. It made the sink in my life. Now, all I wanted to do was get to my stereo and plug in my headphones and turn it on because I had been without, well, there was a jukebox and a few songs on that jukebox drove me even deeper into the twilight zone. I plug my headphones in, I turn it on, and what do I hear? I hear the DJ say, and these are her exact words, welcome to Fantasy Park, the concert in your mind. The station that weekend was pretending that they were playing a concert and that all of the music they played were live bands. Now, this was in 1975. They were trying to redo a Woodstock. I listened to a few songs, but they did nothing for me. They made me question everything. So I turned it off, fixed the flat on my bike. I went for a ride. Well, for the next year, I gained 100 pounds. I went into a state of depression to where I sat looking at the television, screaming in my head, clawing at the, my skull from inside. I have nothing to think about. I have nothing to talk about. I don't want to live anymore. But for the first three weeks before I would go to sleep, I would lay in bed and I would remember every moment of the three weeks prior to being put in that hospital. I recalled every detail of the grove, every, every synchronicity, every, everything. I, I kept it fresh in my mind. Well, year went by, gained 100 pounds. My mother and I basically communicated in baby talk, and I was a basket case. 
literally. Then it came to me, what about your universal language? Oh, I remember it. So I started running it through my head. 1A, 2C, 3G, 4S, 5K, etc. As I'm looking for a small, loosely phone book that I had written it down in. And I get that phone book out. And there, there is a pure mathematical mathematics to my gematria. I reprogrammed my mind with the earth code. And I managed to lose 100 pounds, become active, become, you know, not the life of the party, but I sure was back to being what I was before the cops picked me up that day. That was the amazing thing. After all I had been through, I my mind was better than than it was before these events ever took place. Okay, life goes on, life goes on. I was on unemployment. I got a job, you know, yada, yada, yada. Synchronicities just kept happening because I had what I call now the earth code running through my brain. Synchronicities kept happening, kept happening, kept happening. Okay, I came to another point in my life where what's this all about? I had a girlfriend. Yes, I know what it's all about. I had a girlfriend. And one night I went off the deep end with the earth code and the police officer said to me, do you want to take the ambulance or do you want to take the cop car? I pointed at the ambulance. I got in the ambulance and they said, do you want to go with the sirens on? I said, sure. And when it, when they come on, we are all going to turn into cartoons. Believe me, you Cannot imagine what I saw when those lights came on. Okay, next morning, I wake up, psych ward, Hollywood Memorial Hospital. And I said, damn it, I did it again. I did it again. I, I went too far. Excuse my English. Well, once they released me out of the quiet room, I became the star of the ward. Staff thought I was staff. Visitors thought I was staff. Uh, patients thought I was staff. And just to give you a few examples of what I'm talking about, we were sitting in a, a group counseling session and I'm talking to this one girl, very pretty, very young, that everybody's taking advantage of. And I'm sitting there talking to her. And there was also a semi well-known rocker. This was a pretty, you know, these people were paying good money to be where the police had taken me. I'm sitting there talking to her. The counselor comes in. He sits down. I'm talking. He starts talking. He lights a cigarette when you could smoke in hospitals. He lights a cigarette. And I go on and I'm talking to this girl. And he says to me, as he puts the cigarette in the ashtray, he says to me, what are you doing? I says, well, I'm helping her out. <clears throat> as he lights another cigarette, he says to me, I see you like to control the world around you. And I said, yes, I do. As I pointed to the first cigarette he lit in the ashtray, I get up and walk out. Well, no joke. Seven of the eight people in that room left the room with me. The other person wasn't sure he wasn't still on Mars. That little respite, I taught the uh, patients that, hey, this is our home and the staff is visitors. And the less you have to talk to the doctor, the more the doctor knows that you're getting well. Well, it was our home, and we were up till 3.30 in the morning, shooting pool, eating snacks, and having a good old time. And you know what? The staff was happy to see it because we didn't bother them. I was released from there, and life goes on. A few more incidents that I won't go into, but I must say I have gained and lost 100 pounds three times in my life. And at the end of every time that I got fed up with the weight, I would bring the earth code back and I would be better than I was even before the first time I got in that police car at Monty Trainers. This blew my mind because, my God, I don't care how destroyed you are. I don't care what a basket case you are. I don't care as long as you can think, as long as you can still 
make synaptic connections in your mind, you can be better than you ever were. And I'm an example of that. Because believe me, I've been there. I've done it. I have been insane. And I said I wasn't going to remember Bert in uh, uh, Bert. He used to snap his fingers and be invisible. Well, believe me, I was there and I did that. And I was charged with assaulting two police officers, which never happened. And this is a cute story. I told the defense attorney exactly what was going on. And when well, when I went to an arraignment, my defense attorney, which was a woman, and the prosecutor was a woman, and the judge was a woman, my defense attorney, she said, Your Honor, we've worked this out, one year probation. The judge's jaw dropped. And she said, have you discussed this with the police officers? And the prosecuting attorney said, yes, we have. Judge hammered down, one year probation. And that was the year that Andrew hit South Miami. And I did my one-year probation, and I got off. Well, here I find myself with all this knowledge, all this wisdom, the earth code. I don't want to call it wisdom. It's just being awake and aware. People, I hate to tell you, I'm 62 years old. And I, you can hear my voice. I am a 14-year-old in an aging spacesuit. Ah, and I am the avatar <laughs> of a certain being that just stepped into my life one day and said, son, I got a deal for you. We'll go into that another show. So here I am on Truth Frequency Radio, flying solo. I have to catch my breath. And light another series. No, seriously. The synchronicity and the earth code. What it's done for me and the 41-year-old monkey on my back. It has driven me insane because I keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. As insane as it gets. My problem was... Every time I would peek out like I am now, having a radio show on Truth Frequency Radio, I would overdo it. Well, today I had to go to work, and I realized one thing. I have learned my lessons well. The secret is the gentleman who approached me in Coconut Grove. No, it wasn't until 19. 92, did I become aware of who that gentleman was? At the time I was married, I was starting to write my book, and believe you me, the synchronicity was off. It was beyond Twilight Zone. My book is full of examples, and I'll just give you a few. I'm standing outside with my stepson, who's about 13 at the time. And I'm letting him know, your mother did not marry just some schmuck, excuse my English. Because at that point, I thought I was special because the synchronicity was incredible. So I went into my Grove experience with him. I went into the Earth Code with him. And he thought it was the coolest thing because he saw the synchronicity when he was around me. The next day, I come home from work. He comes out on the balcony with me and the billboard on the other side of the expressway, we're on the fourth floor balcony. The sign on the other side of the expressway has been changed overnight. And it is now a J and B ad, but it's in Morse code. I know Morse code. I told him that's Morse code and it says J and B. He thought it was cool because we were talking about a code the night before. As I'm writing my book, the Rolling Stones are on stage at Joe Robbie Stadium, which in my reality is Junior's Bar and Grill. I'll get into the, the, um, the secret code in music. Maybe later tonight, maybe not. But I discovered there is a code in rock and roll, and it is such a devious, devious plan that I want to beat on a drum. 
and salute those who are about to rock. Wow. Well, a few examples. Rolling Stones are on stage. Bridges to Babylon tour. The DJ says there are gate crashers. <laughs> I walk outside to the balcony to have a cigarette. I look down and what do I see? For real. A car had crashed into the security gate below. I'm taking, you know, I'm, at this point, I'm not having, I'm not having goosebumps. It's just normal. It's just normal. Well, I'm sitting down and I'm writing my book. And I listed the three songs that I listened to at the jukebox at a Pizza Hut in the year 1975. And they were Hypnotized by Fleetwood Mac, Smoke on the Water, and uh, Golden Earring, excuse me, <laughs> Golden Earring, <laughs> Very Our Lover. As I finished typing these three songs, God is my witness, those three songs played on the radio station that I was listening to, just as I typed them out and finished typing them. Okay, time for a break. This is typical in my life. <clears throat> I walk out to the balcony with my headphone extension cord on, and I hear the song by the Rolling Stones because they're playing Bridges to Babylon on the radio as they're in concert. The song that says, uh, wake the, the fireman, wake the fire chief. I look to my left and there is now a car completely and absolutely engulfed in flames. This car is now engulfed in flames. I'm thinking, well, cute, cool, great, wonderful. A few more examples. Some examples dang near knocked me to my knees. And I'm going to give you just a, a few really, really good ones. Uh, one example, driving in my car. The clock says 1033. Earth code, that is Amplified Jesus. I turn my radio on, and God is my witness. The words were, Jesus is just all right with me. The Doobie Brothers were right on cue. Typical day. Uh, I'm driving back to work from lunch at, from a uh, Cumberland Farms. I go to the first intersection at a stop sign. I look left. I look right. I look left. I look straight ahead. As I start pulling out of the pulling into the intersection, I hear screeching brakes that went on and on and on. And I look to my left, and here is this yellow Camaro sliding across my front end, and it's settled about 20 yards away from me. I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, well, I'm waiting to see backup lights and see if I have a confrontation with this gentleman because I just pulled out in front of him. Well, he drives away. I sit there thinking every second, every second that I don't do the next thing I do is critical. It's that critical. I'm sitting there thinking, well, this idiot came flying around that corner in his hot rod Camaro and never once considered there was someone around that corner, and it was me. Well, I put the car in drive, and as my front end crosses the other side of the street into the alley behind where I work, I turn the radio on, and I know damn well that there's going to be a reflection of what just happened. Now, you're not going to believe me, but I do, and I know it happened, and God knows it happened. I turn the radio on. What do I hear? I hear screeching brakes, tires that go on and on and on, and then a crash. And the announcer says, so you think you're a good driver? Take the safe driver test with Ann Bishop at 10 o'clock tonight on Channel 10. I drive slowly back to work. Another typical, no big deal. The best one of the best ones was, oh, one really good one, which was key to me, because at this point, you've got to believe that you're being watched by DJs or you're 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 on a secret webcam that you're being watched. Before I go, when I had enough of music, here's an example which proved to me that I was not being watched and people were playing music according to my actions. I one day just out of nowhere, started wondering what was the actor's name 
in the movie where there was a duel for his soul and it was Ralph Macchio. Well, I could not remember the name of the movie. I sit down in the car, I turn on the radio, and what song came on? Can you name that movie? That's right. Crossroads, an instant answer to my question through the radio, which only showed me one thing. Nobody can react fast enough to answer a question on my mind. Okay. Well, it was getting so intense. One day, I couldn't take it anymore. It had no rhyme. It had no reason. And all it did was wind up me helping other people out of their reality, their alternative realities in a psych ward. That was always the end result. Well, I'm sitting in the car. I can't take it anymore. There are five other cars in the shop at all times, and everybody's playing a radio. I turned my radio off. I taped the trigger to my air drill on so I don't hear music and I go about my business. Well, didn't work. Out of the far end of the shop, I hear the words, since you've been gone, all that's left is a band of gold. I look down at my wedding band and it's not there. I panicked for half a tenth of a second and I jumped out of the car because I remembered I took that ring off to help a co-worker run a drain tube from a sunroof into a very tight wheel well. I had to take it off to get my hand in that wheel well. I left the ring in the trunk. As I'm getting out of my car, he's backing the car out of the stall to be delivered to the owner. I stop him. I open the trunk. I retrieve my ring, put it on. As I'm going, God, for whatever reason, this is happening. It's a good thing. Back to the earth code and its properties. The phone number that the gentleman just read was 333, I think, 23. Well, 33 is Jesus. 333 is God. Now, 333 is God's number. I live in the 333 zip code. I live in God's zip code. I live in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and if that ain't as close to the paradise as any other place in the world right now, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, we haven't been hit by a hurricane since Wilma came by, <laughs> and we were talking about that today at work, and I said, I like Betty better. Uh, not too many people caught that, but many did. And then the conversation went to uh, Marianne or Ginger left me walking away, shaking my head. Back to synchronicity. Here is a current and right up to the moment happening. I was on Freaky Friday. We were talking. I bring up, hey, Stan Deo has discovered where the Garden of Eden is. I'm talking about Stan Deo and Kev says, oh, yeah, I've heard of him. Yeah, I followed him. Yada, 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 yada. <clears throat> Well, the show's done. I'm listening to Chris and Cherie Geo, and Zach is talking about Gematria, which is the code. And what his code does is it discovers birth dates, people that died, the, the timing of this event, that event. They all add up to the same thing. Well, my Gematria is a code that you instill in your brain. It's a what I call my Pentium for the brain. And here's another little coincidence, people. I and Bill Gates share the same birthday and the same first name. I'm listening to Cherie, and this guy's going on about his gematria, and I'm going, okay, typical, great. You know, the numbers and the letters are gematria is fresh in everybody's mind, and I will be, okay, guess who the next guest is? Stan Deo. I had no idea he was going to be on. So th this is the typical occurrence and events in my life. I could not imagine the past five weeks of my life. I've been in touch with a few lucky is an angel sent to me. She has spent hours and hours and hours on Skype with me getting me ready for this. And for some reason, which will go undisclosed, I missed the first half hour of my show. 
And I'm thinking, well, maybe I don't have a full two hours worth of I never doubt. Kenneth Webb was going to do the show with me today. He has family. He has other commitments. I asked Sean Carone if he would be my first guest. He says, well, that's too early in the day. He has a life. Basically, I felt like I was being cast into the fire. Well, I manned up and said, no problem. I can do this and I can hold your interest. I know I can hold your interest. But what I am most, most, most interested in is getting this 41-year-old monkey off my back and it's called the Earth Code. Now, here's the win-win situation for me. If everybody and everybody and anybody is not interested in it, fine, dandy. I don't have to do any YouTube lessons. I don't have to talk about it anymore. And I'll know one thing. I have got it and no one else has it. But if people are interested in this, I will teach them how not. One of, one of, one of my banners says the earth code. Enter at your own risk. The thing is, you must be brought into it. And what happened to me in the past few months was I am mature enough. I am intelligent enough to teach it, to show people what it does, how it does, and not worry about your sanity. It's very, very, it, it takes, <laughs> what's it take? It takes... Wait a minute, wait a minute, where is... Uh... Tonight I would like to talk about synchronicity and exactly what it is and exactly how deep one can get involved in synchronicity. Uh, some people think, well, if I go to the bathroom and I brush my teeth and I come out and I hear a toothpaste and toothbrush commercial, it is not synchronicity. You are currently doing what the commercial would be on at that time of the morning. Uh, synchronicity. Wow. That, that, that is, uh, in my life, it goes so, so deep. I gave a few examples on Monday and there were a few more that were just as intense as the, the ones I mentioned Monday. One in particular, I'm not a Bible thumper, but I have been known to stab a Bible. Now, it's been many, many, many years since I stabbed a Bible. And the last time I stabbed a Bible, it said, stop raiding Israel. I took that as I am raiding God's word as well as this is real. So I stopped doing that. It has to be at least a decade ago because I did learn my lesson. But I must relate to you one particular incident, which is just absolutely goes beyond synchronicity. It goes with the hand of God driving that knife. I was basically caring for a 52-year-old woman. At the time, I was a youngster. <laughs> I was caring for a 52-year-old woman, and her name was Rita. And I would do this and demonstrate this to her quite often, and every time I would do it, it would fit the situation. But this one time uh, actually sent chills through me. And after all the synchronicities I've seen in my life, that very seldom happen. I proceeded to take a K-bar, which is a marine knife, and stab a Bible. Now, the procedure is I stab the Bible, and then you find the last, last page that that knife has penetrated. You hold it up to the light till you find the last page that it has broken the surface of the paper. And then the then I would ask the person I was demonstrating this to to choose which side, front or back. Well, Rita chose and I read a hole and horses. Believe me, I was uh, pretty uh, happy with myself as well as the proof that there was a hole at the last page that a hole was made by the knife. And then Rita looked at me really strange and pointed to the TV and she was watching Bonanza. There were horses on that television, and there was a hole in the page of the Bible. Synchronicity as well uh, works with the physical world around you. There were times in my life when the wind was a friend of mine. 
the wind and I seem to have a friendship relationship. One particular time, I stepped off of a bus, and as I stepped off the bus, uh, a rush of leaves stopped dead in front of me from a gust of wind. And not realizing how bizarre my thoughts were, it was as if I was greeting a friend. But to me, that was not bizarre. To speak about it now, might you might consider that bizarre. A small branch stopped about a foot away from my left foot. I instantaneously thought wide right. The branch immediately traveled a further distance to go past my left foot. At that moment, I realized, well, wide right from the leaves perception was my left foot. There were times, oh, this all started with the ability. I would call it, it an ability to watch a rush of leaves blowing down the street. And in the moment I would focus on one of them, that leaf would stop as if it was nailed to the ground. I did this time after time after time after time. It, w- it got to be quite entertaining and amusing. As I come out of one sink, I try to remember uh, a specific one that was just as deep in my consciousness, because I'm actually sitting here with my eyes closed, reliving these moments. One of the best ones was I'm walking about a block and a half away from my house, and out of the corner of my right eye, I noticed this pinwheel spinning on a lawn between houses. It was about 12 to 16 inches, one of those uh, pedal pinwheels, and it was spinning quite fast. As it caught my attention, I turned 90 degrees to my right, looked at it, and I thought, would be nice if it stopped. And believe me, it stopped instantaneously of this thought. I stood there pretty amazed. And the moment I said reverse, it went the opposite direction. I walked on down the street and Continue to accept the reality I was living in, because believe me, people, when I tell you my life w- was a twilight zone, believe me, it truly, truly is and was. And then there was one day I, <laughs> I noticed that the crickets were outside and they were making a racket. And every time I opened the door and stepped out, the crickets would stop. So I called Rita. She was on oxygen and she never left the house. I called to her and I said, Rita, watch this. I'm going to open the door and step outside and the crickets are going to stop as soon as I open the door and step outside. And sure enough, they did. Uh, At this point, I'm just trying to relate to you. The life that I have lived is 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 like no other. I've heard people tell me. Oh, there's coincidence this and coincidence that. At this point, I realized that I was definitely in the sights of God. And I have got to tell you a little later on where I know I disappointed God because I personally was not amused by all these signs from God. I wanted what I wanted, when I wanted it, and I wanted it now. And I just became bored. It got to the point where, well, earlier in my life, I got to the point where I don't have to ask for signs from God. He gives them to me whenever I I wish. And as I said, I became bored with it because I was not getting what I wanted. And I basically learned my lesson. Another incident which (laughs) blew my, uh, I had a coworker and we were in a shop, Tony, He worked across the shop from me, and one day his fan is making a racket. The fan is hitting the the retaining cage, and it's making a racket. So I look out of the car I'm working on, and he's adjusting the fan. He's adjusting the fan until it's finally quiet. So when it gets quiet, I say, hey, Tony. And I point to the fan and it immediately begins making a racket again. So I sit back in the car and twice, twice more that day, I stepped out of the car I was working on and I pointed at that fan and that fan started making a racket twice. And Tony just looked at me and he says, 
please stop that. Well, at this point, I thought I was controlling the elements around me. It took a few more lessons for me to learn one thing. I controlled nothing. I do not have the powers to control the wind, to make noise. I have no power. God has placed me in the right spot at the right time, at the right moment to do the correct actions. Because believe you me, when I thought I was controlling that particular day, God did smack me. I walked off my job believing, not believing that I could walk on water, but I knew that day God was on my side and I could do whatever I wanted. And little did I know, well, at that point, I had no concept of what the truth was. And, and as I said, the truth is, I, I, I am in a position where I, I will not go against God's will. You call him the creator. You call him God. You call him Yahweh. I know that there is a spiritual power in my life that works miracles around me. And I, I must offer one thing. I have vowed that if I was Judas in the past, I apologize. If I were Jude in the past, I will be Jude now. I will take on any consequences that the Lord has for me and I will survive, which brings to mind one of the best and most intricate synchronicities. And I often wonder, why did this happen? And the simple answer is just so you could write about it in your book. Now, check this out. I just had my possessions tossed out of an apartment because my roommate ran off with the rent, the money he owed me, and disappeared overnight. So the manager took my stuff because I didn't know the gentleman that was staying while well, I was staying with him, that he just disappeared and he owed rent. Okay, here I am. I'm walking down the street and I see a car with its window open and it's at a dealership. Now, my stuff is out in the rain. And to admit that I walked up to this car knowing the keys were in it at 630 in the morning and confessing to the fact I got in this car and drove away with this car uh, to collect my possessions and move elsewhere. I basically... The spirit has moved me to tell you that I stole a car. Long story short, I, to get to the more interesting part, I am now in a holding cell with about 15 other gentlemen. Some of us are more enlightened than others. For some strange reason, my bunkmate, he reads, no, I read out loud a sentence in a book. And he says to me, well, that's, pretty interesting. And I said, what? He said, you just answered the question that I read in this book. We both, without without a plan, we both got up from our bunks and we went into the common area and there were about 30 books on the floor lined up against the glass wall. We start, oh, we start sticking our hands in the pages and reading where our fingers wound up. The amazing thing is it was like we were holding a conversation. I would say something. He would continue the conversation. I would ask a question. He would answer the question. And then it happened. I read God sent us a cuckoo to confirm our actions. At that very, very moment, a cartoon cuckoo popped out of the clock on the television and we both cracked up laughing. Well, there was a guard in the cell and he calls me over to ask me what we're laughing about. I proceed to tell him exactly what we had been doing. And at the moment I read to him and told him about the cuckoo clock and I read to him, God sent us a cuckoo as to sanction our act actions. The cuckoo popped out of the clock. <sighs> so I figured he he had stepped I generally what happens is when once I become incarcerated or 
hospitalized, the synchronicity and the flow I'm ahead of comes to a halt. And I have words for it. There, there is phasing, which turns into trinactual. Phasing is when you basic synchronicity. But when you tell someone about the phasing event and it brings that person into the event where that person sees what you're talking about, that's called, I named it, trinactual. All right, now, it blows me away that he is in the flow with me. I tell him to pick up two books on the floor. He does. I tell him to just flip through the pages, put your finger in it, and look and see what it says. Well, it said, look and see. I knew it I could do I knew that we were in the flow and he could do it again. He did the same thing in a different book. He put his fingers in the pages and it said, look and see. He looked to me and he said, You've certainly opened my eyes. And I proceeded to explain to him. He wanted to know who I was and why I was there. I told him the story of the car, and I told him who I thought I might be. Now, as to who I might be, believe me, I know I'm not Christ, even though I've had the the Christ illness, whatever it is when you believe you're a Christ. I've also believed that I have been saints in the past, John Baptist, you name it, uh, Judas, I could have been any one of these biblical characters in the past because I fit the role. No. There's a gentleman, and if you were listening Monday, that stood at the stage and asked me, who are you? And I tinkled on the piano, and I said, L10 John, and then I gave you a clue as to just another day in paradise. I'm only going to go so far with this I'm going to mention two songs and I will let you three songs and I will let you decide after I left the Coconut Grove Playhouse I mentioned that I walked home I neglected to mention that after midnight on April the 1st this crazy man stood in the middle of Coconut Grove at Peacock Park on Tiger Tail Road, and I proceeded to orate. I did not yell. I did not scream. I stood there, and I orated. I talked about the code I found in rock and roll, which makes me very mad, because once I disclosed to you what rock and roll is what it was all about. And as we know, uh, most of it was developed by the the families. I forget the name of the town, but you got the Grateful Dead and Jim Morrison's father. It was perhaps a, it was an MK Ultra to basically tear down an entire generation that was growing up. OK, I I went into I was going to pull off the greatest publicity stunt on this planet since John Philippe Petit walked between the World Trade Centers. I went on for about 40 minutes to where there was a building, which is now the uh, the Grove Hotel. It was about a block and a half away, but it wasn't finished. It was floors, but they hadn't put the walls up yet. And my guess is it was about 17 stories high. I was speaking so loud that that building echoed and rang like a bell. I proceeded to introduce myself as Bill Board, Bill Yard. Uh, I jumped on a mailbox and I said, yes, I'm a mailbox. Some of the stuff to me at that time made a lot of sense. OK, it wasn't until 1986 when I. Oh, <laughs> there was one 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 statement I did make, and that was Peter Gabriel. Get out of Genesis. You do not belong there. I mentioned standing on the balcony with my stepson. Around that time when the the ring incident and the uh, automobile Camaro and the crashing uh, of the car on the radio and 
Uh, this was all about that same time. Well, I was in the shop one day, and I hear this song. Oh, to to make it a little deeper, I had a new coworker, and I proceeded to tell him about the synchronicity going on in my life, and sitting in the car and wanting to know the uh, name of the movie Crossroads, and the the song came on Crossroads. It was just a nonstop flow. It just went on and on and on and on. I told him about the Grove experience. I told him what I did. I told him about the gentleman with the gun. I told him about everything. And as I'm standing there, I'm hearing this song, Billy, Don't Lose My Number. I had never heard that song. I said to him, no. This was in 1992. That song came out around 1986. I had never heard that song. I asked him, who is that? He says, oh, that's Phil Collins. I says, what's the name of that song? He said, don't lose my number. I said, okay, thank you. Next time it comes on the radio, I'm going to listen to that song because that song tells me what went on in the Grove that night, March 31st to April 1st. He says, no problem. I got the tape box. So I got the tape box. I look on the tape box and there's Phil Collins face. And I said, damn it. That was him. It's one of the greatest tales you'll ever hear. I hear the song, Billy Don't Lose My Number by Phil Collins. And I look at the tape box and I say, son of a bitch. I went out that back door and had I not, I could have stood there and had a conversation with him. At that very moment, the song comes on. Now that I know the secret, there is nothing that I lack. That's when I started writing my book, which led to my divorce. What transpired causing the divorce, it was not all me or my book. It was, you know, it was personal. From here, I proceed to get in touch with DJs. Uh, and I, there was a time in Miami when maybe, maybe 90% of DJs knew who I was and we would talk a lot. I actually uh, got in touch with the uh, program director at Magic 102, which was an old um, oldie station. His name is Bill Stedman. I got in touch with him and I told him that I wanted to. This was just after the, the Gulf War desert storm happened. Little did I know, you know, the truth about this. I wasn't awake back then. What I was proposing to do was send a book from an 1867 cyclopedia, not encyclopedia. These books were called cyclopedias, and it actually took about four years to produce the whole set. My plan was to send them to people in the media, the news. Uh, Tom Brokaw got one. Ed Bradley got one. Geraldo Rivera got one, just about all the news anchors. I sent them each one, and my plan was to have them give them to President Bush as a thank you present on the 4th of July for having gotten us out of Desert Storm. Well, the media wrote back and said, oh, sorry, we don't create news stories. So I got my books back. But the thing is, Bill Stedman believed in my plan. He thought it was a good plan. Okay, so that that fell through, and I continued to write my book, and, and life goes on. Now, I start listening to everything, absolutely every word Phil Collins sang in a song. I also had the ability at one time, uh, it takes a lot of peace of mind to do what I was capable of doing, I was capable of hearing every word, every note. People ask me, well, what did that song just say? And I tell them what it said. It does not say wrapped up like a douche in the middle of the night. It's revved up like a deuce, which is a type of uh, vehicle, little deuce coupe, whatever. So I listened to the Phil Collins song. And then 
I hear that Peter Gabriel left Genesis and his swan song, his last song with Genesis, which was four months after I told him to leave the group, and he did. It mentions, if, if you listen to the words, it mentions an eagle flying out of the night and him stretching to hear every word, because how could he not listen to such brilliance? As I said, I had tapped into universal knowledge three weeks before this, and I orated a speech in the middle of the grove that night that I, honest to God, know I got the attention of other realms. And from that night on, other realms have helped me. There was a time when I thought, well, maybe it is Satan uh, screwing with me. But no, it was just too, too overwhelmingly spiritual to be anything other than God's hand on me. And as I mentioned last week, my roommate was joking about me getting Howard Stern on my show. And at that moment, I said, no, I'm going to interview the major, Major Henry Hudson from the Salvation Army. And at that point, and right now, I'm, I'm holding well. But at that moment, I started to quiver and shake and goosebumps. And my eyes started welling up with tears. And I realized one thing. God has kept me alive for 62 years after several. It would take two hands to count my number of suicide attempts because I just wanted out of this world. I spent 24 hours on a respirator, and I won't go into any more details about any, any of that because I just got sidetracked, and that's not a good thing. Okay, I now know that Phil Collins has been singing about me because he was there that night and he saw me disappear into the shadows. He was there when I orated. Also, Billy, don't lose my number, disappeared in a blinding light. The blinding light was me opening up that backstage door and blinding him and disappearing. They searched all through the day and all through the night. In the air tonight, (laughs) <laughs> because I was going to be on the air tonight. This is what I've been waiting for. This is what he's been waiting for in the air tonight. I saw what you did. He was there. He heard my oration. How could I ever forget? It was the first time, the last time we ever met, met. I'm pretty overwhelmed right now by putting this story out, but it's in my book. But, you know, some crazy man writes a book. Nobody's interested in it. That's basically been been my um, my take on it. But I do have people that are awed by my book, which does not include my brother or my family. Yada, yada, yada. So here I am. I'm on Truth Frequency Radio, and oh my God. So as I said, uh, my show will definitely be, I I don't want to say unique or one of a kind, but it certainly will hold your interest. I'd like to guarantee that, but it's all in God's hand. If you saw the cute little poster I made today announcing my show, it said, Brooks Agnew or Gary Bird or 7 to 9 tonight, and the Freedom Link logo is in the hands coming down from heaven and there's a little uh, bubble with the words from God in it and it said you may also be doing this show solo so as I said I am a I don't want to say a tool of God because he loves me he doesn't use me as a tool I don't want to say I'm special because I'll tell you one thing everybody Everybody can be this special to God. So God has me here telling you about the life I have lived since March 1975 because I, per se, infected my mind with the earth code. And as I said Monday night, when you do this, the I got to believe they're all positive uh, of positive polarity of those in the realms around you, your brain is a transceiver receiver. When you think, well, hell, the government can do now, they can read your mind and what you're thinking, 
why why wouldn't angels or demons or those in the realms around us know what you're thinking? I will be getting this 41-year-old monkey off of my back. And you know what? I'm not going to miss it because it's going to be my friend now. But it has driven me crazy. It has shown me a life that I believe no man has ever lived on this planet because I me. And no one's ever lived my life. That much I can guarantee you. Music. With the Earth Code, you discover a lot of things. You make synaptic connections in your mind that will blow your mind. Before I get into the music and the code I discovered in it, I must tell you, with, with the Earth Code, you will develop a memory that is like unrivaled. I will wake up in the morning. I will see the number. I will interpret it into Earth Code. And... The situation, the number, the code, the incident, is it's a memory for life. I was on uh, Quest for Truth. I went to sleep at 3.36 in the morning, which is God doing God, which is also doing within Christ. Simple. I remember the moment I woke, uh, the moment I went to bed after Quest for Truth. Well, I woke up at 9.19, which is question thirst, which is exactly, yeah, I had to get to my coffee. So the, the earth code is, is very involved, very involved, but it is so simple. As I said, you just make synaptic connections in your mind where the realms and those around you, they're aware of what you're thinking because your mind has focus. Your mind has this, it's not a virus, but it certainly is a program, which is broadcasting it. So I've, I've offered this to many people. And as I, I said Monday, I, I don't want to keep bringing up Monday, but it reminds me of what I did say and why I said it and actually what I forgot to talk about. And I'm sure glad that Sean Carone called in. Uh, because I, I did mention that you can manifest in this world, and it's called law of attraction. I, I It's part of my vow and my deal to say you have a deal with God. I requested that God give me no special powers. I requested that I do this as a simple man, as a basic man. As just the common schmuck, if you will excuse the expression, because I wanted to be able to help those who were the person that I asked God to allow me to be. This way I could help. I did an introduction for my show and I gave the soundtrack and the words to Chris. He said it was pretty good considering and that he would make it better. I expect to hear that someday. I'm not because I yet have to convince myself that I can do this show full time and deserve, deserve to take Joe Joseph's place. Because when I think about that man giving me his show, God ought to heal him this moment. But I don't have that power. He does. Uh, as I said, I'm not a Bible thumper. You want to talk about a spiritualist. Can you imagine what it was like to live as an apostle and see what you saw? You want to talk about interdimensional reality. I've been there and I've done it, but I haven't done it as an apostle in this in this lifetime. So I won't go into who I think I might be of the past besides just about everybody. Getting back to Phil Collins and, and why I wound up, uh, where I wound up so many times. That particular day in my oration, I told him, I don't want your effing help. I don't want anybody's effing help. Because if you help me, you will only help me F it up. Don't ask me where I got this boldness from. Don't ask me why I thought I could do it alone. But here I am. I did it alone with my family and friends at Truth Frequency Radio. I mentioned on Quest for Truth, I cannot cry for myself. I'm sure, you know, I've had plenty of reasons to and I've done it in the past, but I cannot cry for myself because 
I have been so blessed these past four years that it's incredible. And as I said, I'm a simple man. Uh, some people, they get money and it's a trigger and they go out and screw up. Me, you can ask people around me. My money collects dust because it doesn't impress me. Four years ago, four years ago, I had to borrow I had to borrow a dime so that I could go buy a penny candy. Now, four years ago, I went, the song and music and what it's done for me, uh, saved by zero. I have been saved by zero. I have had absolutely nothing three times in my life. I left jail with a pair of shorts on and flippers, uh, jail flippers, and I built my life back up and then I lost it again. So here's the thing. What happened to me was the delusions of grandeur. And Chris at work says, Bill, watch your ego. Watch your ego as I'm telling everybody about having this opportunity to be on the Truth Frequency Radio. He says, watch your ego. I said to him, this little boy running around happy with his new toy is not ego. It's happiness with my new toy. And as I said earlier, people, don't try this. This is for professionals. I'm just, I'm cracking up because here I am sitting in my room talking to myself, which I have done millions of times. But you know what? I'm not alone. I'm with family. And I, I am just, I am awestruck. So as I said, you, you see the, the, the miracles that the positive polarity, God, uh, I could go into who and what I believe Jesus is, the creator, but it's not my place now. I have just a, a few minutes more to make it to the next break. Open up to the world. And you listen to that song by Phil Collins in the air tonight. Just another stranger to you and me. Every, the drowning man he would not lend a hand to. You talk about cover story. You talk about cover stories. Uh, talk about cover stories. Oh, he saw somebody murder somebody in the audience and he saw his face. Oh, he saw this guy who raped his wife drowned and he didn't help him. They're all cover stories. The truth has never come out. He would. The reason I keep the reason you keep me silent, sir. So right now I'm just reinforcing all I've known for since 1992. And here's a few more synchronicities. When Cheryl Crow sings about dude sits down next to me, his name must be Bud, Buddy or bill and he's just one ugly dude well i'm not ugly because i had a dealer a female dealer at the table when she was looking to me to bet or check she says uh handsome what's up i have no idea what i look like so that's beyond here or there but uh i got sidetracked on a poker table being uh told i was handsome <laughs> that's so funny uh cheryl cheryl crow when Phil Collins was at Joe Robbie Stadium doing a concert, I was with my uh, stepson and we went to St. Monica's Church. So, of course, I believe that Phil Collins told everybody about this guy he met in the coconut in, in the grove that night. And he's been trying to wake me up since 1975. And I didn't wake up to the truth until 1992. The delusions of grandeur drove me over the edge, as well as the synchronicity in my life to where I, you know, can't explain to an officer, you know, why I'm doing what I'm doing. And it's the choice of the uh, ambulance or the cop car. Thank you, Frank Castle, because you know what? I wrote to Cherie Geo one night and said, you know what, Cherie, I do the same things these gentlemen do. But I have never taken ayahuasca. I have never tripped on acid. I've taken mushrooms to the point of near hallucination, but I could not relax to let it go. I am actually enjoying my life for the first time since I met my ex-wife-to-be. Uh, I, 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 <laughs> uh, I was born in the same town Frank Sinatra was born in, and my mother told me that uh, she took care of Frank Sinatra's uh, father when he was in the hospital. And she used to talk to Frank in the stairwell when he was a crooner. You know, that skinny little face and the big microphone. Well, one day I'm at a poker table and I got a king to a diamond. It's a little bit of synchronicity here. I have a king to a diamonds and I'm playing Texas Hold'em. 
I have a king to a diamonds and the guy bets $35 and I like kings of diamonds. If you listen to the last show, you'll know why the cards flop. Nothing comes up. Guy bets $25. I'm betting on the cards in my hand, not what's on the poker table. I call him. Well, what comes up? Two more kings. I took his money. And the thing is, I went in with a king, two of diamonds. I called his $35, and he was ripping. Eh, that's poker. The next hand is dealt. The guy before me, he folds. I pick up my cards. It's the king and two of diamonds again. He looks at me. He rolls his eyes, and under his breath, he says, the same, he, he says, the same hand. And I just shake my head. The gentleman bets $35. Well, hell, I got his money from before, so I'm going to put my $35 in. What flops? Three more diamonds. I flopped a flush. He bet. I said all in. I don't know. I had. Anyway, I took him for $135. I went all in. He goes all in. And I beat him. With the flush on the flop. He gets up and he leaves. I said, well, if he's not going to bet anymore, neither am I. I'm leaving. And as I stand up, I started the rumor. I'm Frank Sinatra's illegitimate son. Well, 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 well mom, mom, my mother passed away and I don't think she likes that joke. And that's what it is. It, it's a joke. My father was pretty um, determined to do what he wanted. I guess I got it from him. You know, they say that you can pick your parents. For some reason, I picked my father, and I won't go into details about my father, but he was classified out of the Marines around the Korean War. He was classified 100% mentally disabled veteran. My mother was a Florence Nightingale. She was a nurse her entire life. I'm, I'm trying to regress back to when I made the decision and why I came to this world in this family. My mother worked as a charge nurse, which is the head nurse of four floors in North Shore Medical Center. So the reason I came in was to defeat the insanity that my father had been classified with and to have the caring and the loving humanity that my mother had her whole life. There is so much sorrow in this world. Do you realize how lucky you are to be living where you are, to have an internet connection, to not have bombs falling on your head? This is just, this is just my reality. I wake up in the morning and I am so grateful that I live where I live, you look at the rest of the world, the sorrow in the world, and you have got to be grateful that you are able and capable to do the simplest of things, the shower, the bathroom, because soon the empire is going to fall and I am not a fear monger. I just wish that everyone would be prepared for the change.